Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Online. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs at the museum. It is my pleasure to present Jeffrey Gibson and Corinna Emmerich in conversation. Their talk will be moderated by Regan DeLogans. They will discuss Native American fashion design. Gibson is an award-winning artist whose work combines traditional Native American elements with contemporary references. Emmerich is the founder of Emmy, a fashion brand which reflects her indigenous heritage. Enjoy the show. Uh, Halito, and welcome to uh, the FIT's continuous series. And we're going to be having a discussion today with uh, indigenous designers and multimedia artists, Jeffrey Gibson and Karina Emmerich. Hi. <laughs> uh, Karina is in the Indigenous Kinship Collective along with myself. Uh, and is a fashion designer as well as an activist. And Jeffrey Gibson is a multimedia artist as well as a all around cutie. And I've been so blessed to spend time with them and uh, call them my kin. So I think that when it comes to the conversation that we wanna have today, first of all, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll actually introduce myself in my shoot seed. Hasaheo, Tuogwalapu, Mwalapu, Daishan, Deseyaiaia. Karina Emmerich Sitsa Talal Chad Poyala. Um, so good day to my relatives. <laughs> um, my name is Karina Emmerich. I am originally uh, I'm I'm Puyallup, um, so originally from the Northwest Coast, and um, I've been residing here in Lenape Hoking for about twelve years now. Um, I'm Jeffrey Gibson, um, Mississippi Choctaw, and half Cherokee, and I live actually in Hudson Valley up north, about two and a half hours north. And uh, multimedia artists, so happy to be here with Regan and Karina. Um, I have so much respect for them. And so let's get started. Excellent. And my name is Regan DeLoggins, or Siha Chipa Yok Regan, Mississippi Chapa Sia Hoke, Hasa Koba Sia Hoke, Utalia Lenape Hoking. Hi, my name's Regan. I'm Mississippi Choctaw as well, and have been living here in Lenape Hoking for uh, 11 years. It's been so long. Um, so again, super thankful to be sharing space with y'all today. Uh, we've definitely worked on many a project together before, um, but this is going to take more of the form of an interview. And I guess my first question for y'all is that as Indigenous people, art making is a part of our community as, as not just art making, but as education, as knowledge sharing. And it's part of, a, I think, a continuous conversation of community work. And so I was wondering, how do you see your work fitting into the role as an educator, as a knowledge sharer? I think, I think as artists and designers, I often say that we are storytellers. And so the visual representation of the stories that we, that we share is, is a big part of the work that we do. Um, we have a lot of conversations about um, like meaning behind the work that we do. And I think that we're going into a stage now where that representation of authenticity is really important um, so to be able to share stories and to share the, the, the creative outlet um, in like what inspires in what inspires you so my last collection I really wanted to focus on my homeland so the inspiration came um, from the Cascade Mountain Range which is something that I miss the most being away so far away um, but yeah, so I, I think I think it's just ingrained to have this kind of like outlet. I mean, I, I grew up away from my homelands a lot because of my father's job. So I grew up in Germany and Korea, um, moving around the U.S. and um, then did graduate school in London. So I think for me, a lot of it's been about reclaiming space for myself here, but trying to bring 100% of who I am into my artwork, which includes indigenous histories and specifically Choctaw and Cherokee aesthetic histories, plus familial stories and narratives. And um, that's been my personal challenge. And my hope was that if I could articulate that space for myself, that it would make space for other people like me whose narratives don't fit very neatly into even, even specific tribal kind of definitions. I really vibe with that. I'm, I'm also similar. I also grew up in, in uh, Europe and Germany and then came back to my homelands later in my life. And I think a lot of us have uh, different narratives as, of indigeneity than what is expected through uh, unfortunate stereotypes is really what it boils down to. And I really like that you brought up this idea of authenticity. And I was hoping that maybe you could unpack that a bit more. I can't separate pieces of me in, from my work. So a lot of the things that I hold 
in my values and in my morals, those will come through in my work and that there, there's, I don't create a divide between those two things. So when we talk a lot about, um, like if, if we're talking about the extraction industry um, and just having some transparency around like the monstrative industrial practices that are going on, those are things that I talk about that also resonates through my work. So, so I don't, I was told early on to separate my politics from my work, and that's just not something that I've ever been able to do, nor have I ever been able to do in my in my life in general. So I think that now that there's this like marriage between the two, that although I can be inspired by a multitude of different things, because we we are as indigenous people, we're, we're still you know, existing in this world that is a wealth of inspiration. It is not like the only thing that, that we look to. So I think that I come to find that I have to, um, that I don't want to separate those parts of myself in order to fit into this mold that's expected in like the larger fashion industry. I'm really glad you say that because actually my next question was going to be specifically about being an activist and a designer and how often and also being an artist and activist, how often those intersect. And we don't, I don't think we have the privilege as indigenous people to divorce the two. So I was just wondering like, why was it that you chose fashion as your desired mode of both activism and design? It's really interesting because I can, I can think back to like when I was in eighth grade <laughs> and I always knew that I wanted to be an artist and my father was an art teacher when I was growing up. So it was something like during the summers we would spend all of our time doing art projects. And I distinctly remember thinking in my head, well, how can I be an artist and still make money? And for whatever reason, my answer was to become a fashion designer, which, which has been like a difficult path to go down. But I, I've always really liked fashion and clothing as my medium. And I've always really been interested in uh, like the decoration of the human body. And the first garment that I ever made was actually my jingle dress regalia. So that was kind of the, this, I remember standing at the table creating this, this piece thinking like, oh, this is what I want to do. And I, and I also think there's something about having like this really tactical, tangible skill that I really, that I really like and enjoy. Um, and, and that's my favorite part of, of being like a clothing designer, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that, um, I followed a, a, standard path in the fashion industry because I don't want to separate my beliefs and my morals. So like ethical, ethical consumption is always something that's really important to me. And, and as indigenous people, we often think about how, how our choices affect land. And that's a conversation that needs to be really, really talked about and focused on in the fashion industry right now. So when we're going into these veins of sustainability, that now is considered an activist mode, right? But really what it is, is we're just talking about the ethical treatment of other human beings and stepping away from this industry of exploitation. And so those are things that I never want to separate. And I, I firmly believe in people over profit, and that's not something that I will ever change as, as somebody who is working within an industry. And that's something that I need to speak out in order for those exploitative practices to change. Jeffrey, you've expressed before that you don't necessarily see your textile based work as fashion. And I was just wondering, what is like, how do you define fashion? I define fashion a couple of different ways. Um, I think there's the popular cultural accepted definition of fashion, which is like what you buy in stores, what you wear. We could call it fast fashion. We could, you know, and then there's these hierarchies from haute couture down to like, you know, ready to wear. And um, by its approach, you should include, include vintage and thrift. Um, and, and then there's, uh, it's interesting actually, when Valerie Steele and I did a talk at the New Museum and we were talking about how do you talk about fashion in relationship to a traditional garment, um, native garment. And, you know, she was saying, well, it's fashion. Like, of course, everyone wants to think of fashion as fast fashion, but it's really about individual choices about how somebody marks and identifies themselves. And I think for me, the definition kind of oscillates between those two things, because is that true? Yes. It is about the choices you make to adorn yourself and how you signify to other people, um, what your value system is, what your priorities are, who you belong to, where you come from. On the other hand, I think um, I can't really argue that 
um, mass produced fashion is what a majority of people I think think of as fashion. And so I can't disassociate those two things. And, um, and maybe that's why I choose to call my garments not fashion. I wanted to indulge in the absolutely unique, the absolutely, um, to some degree, it's like impossible to reproduce them. We don't um, really have patterns. We kind of improvise and everything's very process oriented and I don't really make decisions um, from the beginning. I, I make them along the way um, until something is complete and then we don't actually replicate it. Um, also, the amount of hand work that goes into the garments that came out of my studio, um, it is financially totally impossible to calculate it, to give it a price tag in the sense yeah. of a, a fashion structure, a fashion pricing structure. So, and that's something that as an artist, I've been able to indulge in, you know, so something can take hundreds and hundreds of hours. Um, and originally I was interested in comparing that to a kind of couture atelier handcraft value system, but ultimately that system from where, from the way that I look at it, hasn't really shown interest in indigenous handcraft and, and bringing it into that structure. So I decided to be okay with that. I, I went to school actually at FIT for, um, for fashion history. And I had that same issue where I felt as though indigenous craft and artistry and even fashion didn't fit that mold because it wasn't ever about uh, capitalism. And even in the couture world, it is in the end about a product being consumable. And I just don't see either of y'all's work really as something that's so easily consumable. And so I wonder if that's um, inherently indigenous to kind of push back against capitalism, or if we as activists just look to push back against, cap uh, against capitalism. Right. As, as much as we want to talk about not engaging in a capitalistic system, we're, we still have to engage in our own survival and we we are surviving within a capitalistic system. So it's like if we think about um, what if I was to think about what my options were as, as a clothing as a clothing designer, I could be a cog within the system or I can choose to to work for myself and and create my own, you know, you know, structure yeah. within and within my within my own beliefs. And that's something that's really interesting, but it is, but then it is, it's like we get into this idea of consumption, um, which is something that I've always grappled with because I've always wanted to be a small, small designer. But, but now we're at this point where people are, um, where people of color are really being amplified and, um, people really want to support that work. So then, so then it's this, this weird push and pull of like, so how do you grow and still maintain these like sustainable ethical systems? And so I think that's something that this this kind of thing needs to be an ongoing conversation, and it's not something that there's a there's a right or wrong answer. But um, I think you know, and also just speaking of being uh, indigenous designers is like not everything that we do necessarily needs to be for consumption. And I think that's a question that I get a lot is, do you design only for indigenous people or is it something that can be shared? And I say, I wouldn't sell it online if I, if it wasn't uh, something that was to be shared. So, yeah. I think that you've touched on, both of y'all have touched on, so I kind of want to dig a little bit deeper. Is There's this conversation happening right now. There, like you said, there's an elevation of BIPOC voices, Black, Indigenous, and POC voices uh, for a number of reasons. And I want to know, where is that line between um, pushing back against invisibility and tokenization? And at what point, at, for me, often, the line is very blurred. So I am curious, as, to, as both of y'all have very large platforms or in many institutions within different collections, I wonder, what is that conversation, what does it look like for you? between tokenization and breaking invisibility? I mean, for me, I, I definitely have gotten a lot more requests in the past couple of years um, in, in terms of like exhibitions and sitting on panels and boards. And um, I, for instance, with the board conversation had started with saying, it's like, well, I don't want to sit on a board if I don't, if I'm not able to see my impact. So just know that coming in, I will be very vocal and I will um, expect to see 
what I say to be taken seriously and I'd like to see the impact of it. I think I, I, I come from the perspective of, you know, this is what it is. The world is what it is. The tokenism is going to exist. Um, the pigeonholing is going to exist. I'm more interested in if I'm going to play in this game, I want to leave an impact behind me. Um, and all of those other circumstances will continue to shift into the future. But if this is a period for me to amplify my voice, then I'm going to take it. And then there are times when I feel if I'm compromising too much or I'm being asked to compromise, mm -hmm. I have enough opportunities going on that I can say no to any single one of them. The, the main frustration I think that, that can potentially per, be perceived as problematic, especially within the fashion industry, is I, it seems that the industry is more focused on the commodification of diversity than they are actually about giving up your seat at the table because representation does not mean equity. And so for like right now in the fashion industry, it's like continually putting people of color, amplifying people of color, putting them on the cover of magazines. It's still, it's still commodifying people of color in order to sell a product to them. And it's not actually about, oh, I'm going to give up this, my seat at the table and really think about what inclusivity means. Because if we're thinking about the people in power, the, those systems are still not inclusive. And for you to just use representation and think that you're being inclusive is, is a very minimal step in the movements that we're trying to create in order to amplify our voices. And I think that pigeonholing is something that continues to happen because when we're in these conversations about being indigenous designers, it's like one of the only things that's focused on when we are, we exist in all, all different avenues. And that is something that is in, incredibly important to amplify. But, but then you, it feels like that's the, that's all you're being given to offer where you, you just simply are existing as an indigenous artist or an indigenous designer. And, and the book stops there when, when it is now i'm now i'm curious to see as we move forward where these conversations continue to go and if we're actually going to start seeing change in how in representation in who's in power and yeah with these kind of amplifications of voices i think there's an indigenous network that can occur that we can begin building our own institutions outside of the pre-existing institutions and with different kinds of structures and different kinds of systems. Um, I think even within the Native community, it's important that we make sure we're representing each other and people who are not always represented. The, the kind of diversity of people and makers within Indigenous communities is really huge. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, that's a problem that I would welcome. You know, that's a problem that I would welcome to think, how do we how do we embrace like traditional making in um, relationship to contemporary making? Um, how do we kind of, because that's for other indigenous people. Like that's, that's us doing work to support ourselves, mm -hmm. which I think is really for me, the ideal outcome of all of this. And that's, and that's also where I think transparency becomes so important. Is as we're creating these communities of support and to uplift each other is like there like there is no singular path to get to where you are like our, our all three of our experiences have been quite different and yet we find ourselves sitting in this room together and we come from well you guys come from <laughs> similar back but you know we all come from different places and I think that the community of support and transparency now is so important in order for us to continue uplifting other other designers and other voices. And that's where, like, you know, what, what can potentially be problematic, the pros and cons of social media comes into conversation because there is now this time that we're living in where we can, we can find and amplify indigenous designers, you know, looking through our phone. And it's not something that's like this this like so old school ancient craft it's like no it's happening now it's modern it's progressive and there's a future for it um i i think that social justice and art has always has always gone hand in hand and i think a lot of the people that i look to um who have been inspirations to me have existed in some kind of art artistic platform um and and i think that creating visualization is a way to really impact people 
um, so like the action that we did um, on, in Jeffrey's exhibit at the sculpture park, um, it it was it was it was kind of like this like this like massive, you know, very like prominent banner drop that we did in association with your with your work, which already has its own message, and it's kind of this way of creating something that's so visual and so representative of what the the ask is, what the call is, is that it's it's a, you know, you can you can consume this kind of like art and you can consume these feelings because when you when you have this all of this inside of you and it comes out through your hands onto the work that you're doing, that that emotion translates. And I think that in social justice is really important for that to translate. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think being an artist, you're hitting, I guess when I think about the version of political activism that I grew up with, it was very like cause, reaction related. There was this kind of like two things that were in dialogue with each other and usually pushing up against each other. And as an artist, I feel like I grew up thinking like once we can define it as political, people are already showing up to the table with their politics. So in many ways, that conversation is about validating what you already believe in. Art can kind of like sneak up on you in ways that suddenly you're wearing something and it makes you feel liberated or it makes you feel bigger than you're used to feeling or sound hits your body in a way that is unexpected or community feels different because it's fantastic. And we can sustain fantastic for an evening. We can't necessarily sustain fantastic for a lifetime in the way that we can in an art event. So I think that I always thought about art as having the ability of just kind of shifting um, circumstances. And for many indigenous people, we've never felt liberation in the way that it's like, you don't have to perform indigeneity. You don't have to perform gender. You don't have to perform class. You don't have to perform culture. You literally get to let your body feel like it can just be in a space. And for me, that was very liberating as part of an arts, arts education. So that's what I hope to create for some people. I think that from my experience, I think you have created that, being that most of your work encompasses community in some way, shape, or form. I mean, you've invited us to perform and also just to be in space or in other, and I feel even with your sculpture at the Socrates um, Sculpture Garden, you see it's had many iterations and people are sitting on it and people are interacting with it and kids are trying to climb it and there's a banner drop and then there's a dance performance. There's like a multi, there's a multifaceted contribution that it has. Is that your intention with every piece or just more public, like larger out, um, larger facing ones? Um. Well, as far as the piece at Socrates Sculpture Park, that, it's interesting. I've been able to articulate it since it opened. Like, what what actually arrived there was um, compulsive, and it was an impulse. It, when I was invited, just immediately I thought, this is my opportunity to make this big structure that I haven't been able to make elsewhere. And then it was kind of a scramble to finish it. But I've been happy to know that it's had a similar um impact in the way that an intimate piece in a museum might work. I try to use text in a way that people can ref see themselves reflected in the text. So it usually, for instance, in Numbers Too Big to Ignore, um, which is a lyric from Helen Reddy's song, I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar, um, I originally used to reference Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women um, back in 2016, I believe, or 2015. And, um, but I also knew no matter what your politics were, you're going to see yourself in that. Even if I was a complete right wing conservative, I might feel empowered by those words and numbers too big to ignore, or I might feel threatened by those words because it's all about who are you talking about and who's saying these words. So in that sense, I do want to invoke, um, relationship, you know, and I guess relationship meaning me to one other person or the work to one other person and maybe the larger work invites community meaning multiple bodies and multiple people and during these contemporary times of crisis and when i say crisis i mean both covid and um, uprisings and changes in social justice uh, i wonder how that has impacted your methodology and if that 
methodology has now forever changed or if it's a sustainable model. And I, I just wonder what does it look like in terms of what, how you practice as designers and artists previous to COVID, how you practice now and how you'll practice in the future. Have you been, or has your work been ever changed? Um, yeah, I think, I think this time is going to have an impact on everybody. And I think that it, COVID itself has unveiled a lot of systemic issues. Um, I've been really, really blessed to be able to have uh, like the support to be able to like ma maintain paying my rent or buying food during this time, which a lot of people don't have that. Um, so that itself is, is something that, that we need to start paying attention to. Um, but also just like these ideas that are, that are going on about the inclusivity within industry and equity within industry, something that we, no matter how progressive you think you are, there's always something that can be learned. And that's why these things need to constantly be continuing conversations because there's never going to be one point where you go, okay, uh, like I understand everybody's life experience. So now I have a gold star. It doesn't work that way. And that's why these conversations keep need needing to be had in us to create like e equity center, even if we're talking about business itself. So like, as I, my clothing line, as I continue to grow or expand, these conversations are something that I need to have continuously. So if we're talking about anti-racism work and inclusivity, we need to talk about inclusivity as being something that spans beyond gender and race. That inclusivity needs to be more about like where you come from, like we can't just hire people who are purely college graduates or, you know, we need to start having these conversations about how to get people into these spaces that they want to be. Um, you know, yeah, I think, I think that it's, it will change methodology in a way, but in a pro progressive and positive way. And, and that's what I hope to see in the future of, of, you know, where, wherever we're going, which is so uncertain is that we're really existing in this completely uncertain time that I don't know what will come, but, um, I will, I, I hope to continue fighting to be able to, to see some actual systemic change happen. In the beginning of COVID and when all of the protests were really beginning and, and coming to the first kind of height, I, um, you know, it was hard to go into the studio and think that this is how I should be spending my time is making things and thinking creatively. And um, I started looking back at work over the past seven or eight years. And I was happy to see that I didn't need to reinvent myself. These are things that I had already been talking about and things I had already been addressing. And I think the current environment, again, it amplifies these and there's an amplified response and there's an amplified seeking of them and when i respond to it my voice became more political or more politicized and um i was talking to somebody the other day and i said you know i don't think anybody who wasn't already paying attention to these things to suddenly start paying attention mm -hmm. i think is maybe a good thing and hopefully that continues if anything i have felt like i've grown personally during this time and there's been some changes that maybe would have ultimately happened, but I feel really committed to them. And I feel really committed to, um, yeah, continuing to be that voice that's sort of bringing these things up for people and having lived through this time to be able to like remind people that it's mm -hmm. like, let's go. Because there's so many people who are so resistant to these conversations. Mm -hmm. And I haven't yet figured out how to kind of, facilitate an effective conversation with some of those people. But that is a goal. That continues to be a goal for me. And I'll probably do it not only as a visual artist. You know, I've dipped into a lot of video. I think the performance has been really growing over the past couple of years as an educator. And of course, I think even continuing to work with some institutions. So Karina, you are in fashion, Jeffrey, you are in art, and they obviously they intersect in so many different ways. And and I myself work in um, museums as a curator, and so I feel as though I'm often doing the dance with the devil of trying to figure out like where 
where is this line of I'm just kind of stroking my own ego and where am I actually doing community work? And often it's a really difficult intersection to navigate, especially during COVID. And I, I really vibe with what you were saying in terms of like, I'm in the studio right now when all these things are happening because I found myself being like, I don't really know how to grapple with the identity of being, let's say, a curator working within institutions and also being an anti-capitalist and being anti-institutional and anti-colonial. And so I, I, I pose this question because I myself have no answer for it, <laughs> which is that, is there a future for these worlds? Is there a future for fashion? And if there is, what does it look like? And is there a future for um, multidisciplinary artwork? And if so, what does it look like? I think, oh my gosh, I, I feel like all, all we do is talk about the future of fashion, what that, what that, what that looks like. And, and again, it goes back to the, that, like, that constant conversation is that there is no singular answer to that question. Um, but I would, I would personally like to see the future of fashion to be much less exploitative, which I think is one of the primary issues with the fashion industry. And, um, I like to think, I'd like to think that fashion could become more inclusive. I'd like to think that fashion can actually support the people that work within the industry, um, that the, that the fashion industry can pay fair and livable wages, um, those are things that I'd like to see in the future of fashion. I'd like to see, it, it's really, it's really incredible working, working within sustainability and seeing the technology that's being produced that is like a regenerative technology. And I think that's something that, that I see personally as a goal for fashion to, to participate within ecology mm -hmm. and that fashion isn't just something that is contributing to waste and landfills that we can start looking to our own participation as people instead of us constantly consuming the resources that we have, that we have to start participating in like a circular economy and regenerative practices in, in our textile design and, and the way that we, way the, the ways that we choose to, to manufacture clothing. So I think that's where I, I personally would like to see fashion going into and, and really the beginning of that conversation needs to start with accountability and responsibility. And those are things that, that I find frustrating right now is that people are so quick to go into marketing their sustainable initiatives without actually taking accountability for the problems that they have produced within this industry. And yeah. The, the, that's what I would like to see the future of fashion. I, I pose this similar question to you, Jeffrey, which is really just like, is there a future for the work that you do? Um, yes, I think there is a future. Um, I just think, I, I don't know if I've ever had that much faith in people. So although people who know me think of me as an optimistic person, and I am always able to see a bright possibility, um, we are trapped in this capitalist system, which even in order to continue, you have to be able to pay your rent and you have to be able to pay the people who are working with you. I can, to some degree, administer a fair micro bubble, you know, in my studio, um, but it's dependent on the commercial art world in terms of being able to sell the work. So, Unless that system radically changes, I don't know how much that kind of flow of money really um, can change, you know. And I think also my aspirations as an artist were set in my head, you know, at this point almost 30, over 30 years ago. And I've worked really hard to like get to the table. So in many ways I'm focused on people younger than myself because I think what I've been able to do is to carve out some of the space that I craved when I was younger. But right now I, I'm responsible for that space that I created. But hopefully the people who I invite in can take some of that um, space where hopefully they feel safe, hopefully they feel supported and they can let some of that go some of that energy expense and like put their energy into where they want to move forward from 
so I'm still I'm I'm still holding on to the 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 kind of format of art histories that I grew up with and the kind of value systems that inspired me to get here, but I do know that it has to change. I'm not sure. I'm happy to support the change and I'm happy to contribute my experiences in any way that supports that, but I really think it will be youth led. I think the conversation about indigenous youth is so important. Uh, Afro-Indigenous youth and Indigenous youth, we've seen so much incredible work done by uh, like the youth for Wet'suwet'en when it comes to what the RCMP are doing in so-called Canada, or the youth on Kumeyaay doing land defender work there against the border. And you know, as someone who is on the, like, I guess, younger age spectrum, I have found that there is like a huge push for radicalization in a way that arguably has maybe happened often in other times of history, but it's been really quite an honor to see people who are even younger than me just like really hammer home radicalization in a way that I don't know if we've seen before um, or will see again in our lifetime. So it's always such an inspiring moment to see the work that's done by you, Karina, and by you, Jeffrey, as at different points of this radicalization and to be kind of in a constant ebb and flow. Like I believe that the work that we do it with the Indigenous Kinship Collective is incredibly righteous um, and helpful, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to be accountable and thoughtful and we don't make mistakes along the way. And so I wonder as a designer who, you know, we're const you're constantly in flux and so are you this like living between worlds um, having to intersect different binaries? I wonder if you feel that if your work is righteous. I, I don't think I would ever personally use that adjective sure. um I, I maybe it makes me uncomfortable i don't know i th i think that i think that it's important for me to in the words that i in the in the speaking that i do for my work to affect change and if that would be considered righteous you know i don't know i, I don't know um but i i think yeah i think that it's really, I think it's about affecting change. And like the longer that I've worked within fashion, I often say it was this really glamorous gold plated dream of mine. And then I started peeling back the layers to see what was rotting underneath. And the, and it was just like, this isn't what I want to do. And, and we're talking about like a decades long failure of what it felt like to now finally these conversations are happening, which is, which is not something that was, I was willing to compromise myself at the beginning and it was kind of like, well, we'll see, we'll see where it goes. And it really felt like a decades long failure. And now all of a sudden, these are the conversations that are happening. And then the people who felt like they were being left behind are now at the forefront of this movement. And that's, that's what I find really interesting is that it's not like we're just jumping on the bandwagon. Like you had said, like, this has always been a part of your work. And I, and I feel similarly that, that now it's like all of a sudden we're pushed into this spotlight because our voices are being heard. And I think if you, if you can, if you can, if you have the opportunity to speak out about it, yeah, take, like take that. And then I hope that I, I don't know that I will be able to see or experience actual change, but I'm, I'm willing to stand here right now to fight for it for, for future generations because why why stay why stay quiet in this like pessimistic world when when there is a, there is a sense of optimism but it's more like a desire for things to really change so do i think the content that we put forward is righteous yes um but righteous as an individual feeling like i am righteous i'm very uncomfortable with and i think a lot of it has to do with the kind of humility that being a behind the scenes maker allows me is very comforting so when I show a painting, it's not Jeffrey Gibson, it's the painting. And even if that's a game that I'm playing in my head, because yes, I'm responsible for it. But even if it's a game that I'm playing, there's this sense of humility that I think allows me to be accessible in a way that I feel like if I saw myself as righteous, I would feel like a split personality somehow. Mm -hmm. But content wise, yes, I think the message is righteous.